Okay, welcome everyone. My name is uh, John Campbell, Councillor in uh, Ward 4, Tobacco Centre, and I'm joined by Councillor Justin DeChano, Councillor in Ward Ward 5, uh, Tobacco South, Lakeshore, Tobacco Lakeshore, and Councillor James Pasternak, Ward 10, York Centre. Center. Yes, and we are uh, three members of the Budget Committee. We've met earlier today here with members of the public, and uh, we will be holding supp subsequent meetings at other uh, civic centers later this week. So we have um, invited the public to come and speak to us to offer their comments on the City of Toronto budget, what you may feel should be the City of Toronto budget priorities, and what changes you may wish to see in our budget process and uh, in our spending. And so tonight I have a list of uh, six individuals who wish to make a deputation. Deputations are five minutes and they will be followed by, if necessary, questions from us to, for uh, clarification and so on. And uh, we will, uh, we're ready to begin. So I'm looking for uh, Syed Diri of the West Coalition on Housing and Homelessness. Good evening, Good evening. and welcome. Good evening, uh, Councillor Chair Campbell and other councillors and members of the community. My name is Saeed Dire. I work with the Children's Aid Society of Toronto uh, for about 17 years, and I'm the chair for the West Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, a group uh, of agencies and individuals who are concerned about the affordable housing in the West End of Toronto and, uh, and the condition of many people who live in poverty. Uh, the Children's Aid Society of Toronto workers have a few tools to assist the families they serve who are dealing with poverty. They respond by providing emergency services to families that are without furniture, without food in their fridge, without diapers for their children. These workers spend a lot of time helping families negotiate and advocate for supports, including Ontario Works, child care subsidies, legal supports to prevent evictions. And emergent services such as the Furniture Bank and the Toronto's Money Food Banks. There is little to be done to help access subsidized housing or child care since the waiting lists are so long. Low social assistance rates combined with rising food and transit costs leave many families unable to meet their children's need, uh, basic needs. And as you do know, sir, Mr. Campbell, Toronto is the leading uh, city uh, in child poverty. One in every three children in Toronto lives, lives in poverty. And that is a very embarrassing thing for a wealth city like ours. The strategy, and, 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 and the, as you do know, Mr. Campbell, the, the city adopted uh, the strategy, to, uh, strategy for poverty reduction uh, strategy, uh, which was a very uh, commendable and important uh, strategy. However, the strategy includes key actions to support children and families, including better access to good jobs and affordable services and supports like affordable housing, access to nutritious food, quality child care, and transit. The strategy also uh, was a leading call for an exploration and expansion of a new revenue tools to fund poverty reduction investments needed this year and in years to come. However, the proposed 2016 budget does not live up to the hopes and direction set out in the poverty reduction strategy. The budget proposes 20 million in new poverty reduction initiatives, less than last year's 25 million. The proposed and current unfunded 20 million is far below the 75 million called for by the community leaders from the business, education, health care, uh, faith and community sectors including Civic Action, the United Way, and the Toronto Board of Trade. In particular, the 2016 budget lacks funding for affordable child care and supportive housing and affordable transit fare. And as you do know, the, uh, as of January 1st, the transit rate has gone up, whereby uh, the, uh, Mayor John Tory uh, gave $6 million to the transit to uh, reduce the, uh, well, to make uh, uh, child, you know, the chil children under the age of 12 for free. So if you give one to this hand and then take fr uh, from the other hand, does not reduce poverty in this important city. 
We have, in his letter, that's the, uh, the mayor's letter, on December 15, Mayor John Tory told Budget Committee Chair Gary Crawford that we must fight for investment in transit, buffer reduction, and emergency services. We agree, sir, but we are disconcerted to hear Mayor John Tory and some councillors say that there is no room to increase taxes or implement new revenue tools to fund these key investments. While it's true that many Toronto residents cannot afford to pay significant, significantly more in tax, there are many who are able to pay and willing to pay a little to ensure that children and families have access to basic services and support they need. The Budget Committee should re remember that out of 24 municipalities in, uh, in, in the GTA, the average Toronto household pays the third least amount in property tax. Toronto also has several untapped revenue tools which could help reduce the cost of services and supports for Toronto residents struggling to make ends meet. For example, the city could implement a road toll or commercial parking levy and use the revenue to reduce transit fares for low-income people. Or it could implement a small tax on alcohol and use the revenue to employ at-risk youth in growing and selling fruits and vegetables grown on city lands. And now the marijuana is going to become legal soon. Just Maybe there will be some revenue generated from that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Campbell. Oh, good. Okay, so there might be some questions, so just uh, hang on one second there. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming down and, and sharing ideas with you. If you, you mentioned a wide range of, of, of policy initiatives, uh, uh, housing, uh, transit. Uh, if, you, if you had to identify... Daycare. Daycare. Uh, if you had to identify um, one that is creating the greatest hardship, uh, what, uh, what would you say? Uh, where we have to focus uh, the most because we we try but we can't be all things to all people uh, council uh, these are all essential services these are all essential needs for families They're, these are not desires or a fans thinks that uh, housing is a human right the only city that does not make uh, housing a human right in, in one of the uh, uh, in, in, in is, is is toronto well uh, the the uh, the, the new Liberal government is willing to uh, invest in infrastructure, and the city must uh, approach the, the, the uh, Trudeau government to help, because in the past, as you do know, the federal government used to help housing. I understand that by law you cannot go a deficit in the city, but you can act on behalf of your residents, of your community, to generate, income, uh, to generate uh, means to resolve poverty. It's a shameful that many people cannot afford to either consider to, put, to pay rent or to buy food. So if we say that childcare will help, it's an investment. If we invest in childcare, a mother will get a job and then will be out of poverty and, 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 and as a counselor for that mother you would be proud to see that housing is also very important yeah. sir well we've we've actually received late today an invitation to uh, meet Prime Minister Trudeau at City Hall tomorrow uh, I plan to go and uh, if you want me to take uh, that message of a national housing strategy to the Prime Minister I'd be happy to uh, whisper that in his ear um, whether my colleagues uh, will do the same, that's, that's, that's up to them. I don't know whether they can make it. But, um, but clearly, uh, there's, there's more work to do, but Toronto is the largest landlord in North America with 175,000 uh, tenants. Uh, and uh, and 90,000 on the waiting list. Uh, and uh, a lack of a partner uh, at, uh, at the federal level, I'll, I'll admit this government's new. So we need a national housing strategy. And to uh, make housing a human right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Mr. Jerry, uh, sorry. Uh, so you, you're, you work for the Children's Aid Society now. Yes, sir. 
And this other organization, West Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, it is a collection of, of agencies like the Unison, like uh, Social Planning Toronto, like uh, Woolner. We come together to advocate, and we're inviting. Uh, uh, we j yesterday we we invited uh, uh, Frank De Giorgio and Councillor Nanziara and the Liberal uh, uh, Ontario uh, uh, Albanese, and also Ahmad Hussein from the uh, 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 a new member for the uh, uh, Liberal government so do, you, do you work out of do to, you, you know to advocate for affordable housing as you do know former uh, city of york, uh, of york is one of the poorest in the city of toronto and its housing stock is also crumpling and right. it needs a repair so it's an urgent call for us to uh, uh, advocate for an investment for those particular areas and so do you work out of sort of you know the, the old city of york or do you are you in a total west end of toronto west and then we coordinate with housing action network in, in in for the old toronto city good okay and so just following up on, on councillor pasternak's line i mean if if you felt that the city needed to if there's one particular area where you felt the city really needed to focus on would that be housing if everything that we mentioned sir because okay. if if i'm hungry and I'm, I'm staying outside, do I need to say, okay, I need a house, a roof over my head, or I need a food to eat at the moment. Human need is always, uh, and human dignity is, a, is, is very important. And what, 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 what inspires us is for us to consider human being as, as a, 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 a essential, their essential dignity is something that cannot be compromised. I understand that the, uh, 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 there are constraints, but you as an elected councillor should envision means to overcome come those uh, uh, barriers right okay very good thank you very much for your thank you sir i appreciate you coming yeah. tonight my pleasure so the next uh, individual is manon dwarka good evening did i pronounce that reasonably close enough, enough. menon dwarka menon yes. well i said it could That's have been it could have been menon yes, as in sure, french right uh, yes thank you yeah uh I'll take a little bit of time just as an introduction to myself because I think it plays into uh, the two main points that I'll be speaking to. So uh, I am the director of 918 Bathurst, which is an arts and culture sanctuary in the Annex. Uh, and I recently moved back to Toronto after spending almost 20 years in New York City leading cultural programs at the 92nd Street Y and Harlem School of the Arts. Thank you. <laughs> I just moved to Six Points in September when I got married, so, so I'm a local now. So. Uh, so what I'd like to address is the fact that 918 Bathurst is a, has a unique business model in terms of arts production in the city. We don't take any money from any levels of government. We've got a, um, a system where we basically rent to permanent tenants, uh, different schools, uh, and subsidize arts production with that money. So we have a self-sufficient um, model. Uh, we have a single patron who comes to our rescue uh, but on the whole, we are a sufficient uh, entity. Uh, my main point with raising, with coming here today, is that without funding from the government for smaller independent organizations, they cannot afford even our subsidized rent. And without that, we can't fulfill our main mandate. Our nonprofit is to present Toronto arts at the grassroots level, at its most interesting and experimental level. And, and we cannot do that if you cut that basic level of funding out from them. We can find funding, but, I'm, but I myself am bringing more than half to the table. And I think that at this juncture in Toronto's cultural evolution, it would be a mistake to take away that other half from these artists that can't afford it. I know that we are supporting the larger end of the cultural sector, uh, but they should at this point in their careers be able to afford and pay their own way. What I'm more concerned with is artists that are just getting a start. When I uh, went to New York, it was because 20 years ago, I didn't feel there was opportunity here. Now there's tremendously much, much more opportunity. And I don't want to have other artists and uh, administrators leave because they feel they can't work here. The second point I want to raise is that uh, I'm also a composer and write music for um, uh, orchestral groups, but I also do a lot of work for TV in the States uh, for my work there. I'm continuing to do this via the internet. What's happening here in Toronto is that musicians can't get a sufficient level of support to keep up their craft. So I have to hire musicians in the States to email me their tracks in Toronto, and then I send those tracks back to New York. And that money should stay here. The taxes, as you can imagine, are quite complicated, but 
I'm basically asking both points is for the council to uphold its end in terms of an economic engine that the arts can provide for the city. Uh, most of you know that the arts supply four times as much as sports do in terms of economic income in the city. And I think we're due some level of support. So that, that's really all I have to say today. Uh, Councilor Holliday has a question. Sure. Thank you. Um, one of the values that some of the larger arts organizations bring to us is they're a, a very efficient way of distributing funds to smaller um, arts groups and artists. And there's a bit of elegance in that in that they receive a, a package of money and they work through their processes, which are open and transparent, but they're quite efficient at getting that money into the hands of the people that need it. Do you, uh, and, and you, you've been here and you've been advocating for smaller um, arts groups and artists themselves to get money. Um, other than those large agencies, do you see another method or have you experienced another method elsewhere that is very efficient at getting money out to the many, many smaller entities that, that could use it? In, in New York, the, um, the Council for New York Fine Arts deals with essentially microfinancing model. Uh, and I don't, I'm not advocating for the larger groups not to get their share. Of course. I'm very worried though if there are cuts that the bottom will come out. And I think it's just the nature of economics that the larger ones will pull more funding. Uh, but I, I, without those people, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this, David Bowie passed yesterday. There may be someone like that in Toronto that needs support, but we don't see them right now. Uh, the larger organizations haven't demonstrated an ability to find those people yet. Mm -hmm. So if we don't pull that level of support down to the ground, we're gonna miss that. So, I mean, I understand, I'm, I should also say I'm part of the Toronto Arts Council Banff right. Cultural Leaders Lab. So, you know, as an individual, the elegance of fun finding me and funding my development is, is noted. But I'm just worried about the people that I support at 918 not getting that funding. Mm. Uh, understood. And, and to me, um, if we are granting dollars to, to get into the hands of the, the artists, we want to make sure that the maximum amount of that money actually reaches them. And uh, I, I suppose my fear in it, in, in if there's a model out there, I hope somebody can bring it to us, is that we don't lose um, the value of the money we put in administration. And that's what we tend to do that sometimes is embed right. programs and build these great uh, administrations around them so that by the time you get to the end of the chain, to the person that needs it, half the dollar is gone. Yes, I mean, that at my day job, that's what I'm most aware of, that the fact Got that it. you know I'm the, I'm the sole person that has a full-time position in my organization. So... Uh, there's got to be a balance, but there are these models that seem to be existing where they emphasize economic development, and that's what I'm most concerned with. When it goes into administration or these larger programs, sometimes it just vanishes, right? So, thank you. Thank you. Well, you go ahead. Sure. Thank you for coming. A couple questions. So, does not the uh, Toronto Arts Council dole out money to individuals? They do. They do. And so, in your estimation, not enough individuals. Is that accurate or? My, uh, I wouldn't say that. What I'm saying is that with a cut, I'm not sure if anybody can say here, me or the four of you, if it'll come from the top, the middle, or the bottom. So what I'm most fearful of is that if it comes off the bottom, we're gonna lose a generation. So are, are you fearful that there's gonna be a budget cut to the arts because are you, are you, are you aware that the Council a number of years ago made a commitment to get to twenty-five dollars per yes capita. I have heard that, and that they're still moving in that direction. I've also heard that there's a five million dollar suggestion in shortfall going to the arts as well. So maybe I'm misinformed about you, you, that. You might have the number, and uh, you might have the number on the wrong side of the ledger. Is that true? Yes, yes. Because the chair of the budget committee is Gary Crawford, is a big supporter of the arts. The mayor is a large supporter of the arts. So I, 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 I do have a, a more substantive question. Sure. When it comes to individuals, how do you make the determination of who warrants support and who doesn't warrant support? That's like asking how can an, an individual validate art, which is a, uh, that's, legitimate that's question. a legitimate question. But I think in terms of sharing taxpayer money, uh, wouldn't, uh, an investment in, uh, wouldn't a return on in investment suggest who the money might go towards. And if you categorize uh, that return investment mostly in economic return, but also social, 
return as well. I think that you can judge who should get the money if the community who is fronting the money receives that attention back. So, and then there's metrics to do this, obviously. If you, if I had a project, instead of a saying that I would like money to make something that's gonna earn no money, versus if I'm gonna start a independent record company that shows Toronto talent and I have connections in the States and Canada, uh, you might wanna lean more towards the second. It doesn't invalidate the first an artist is gonna create regardless. It's important to support, but I think it's also time to also think about economic return. And, and look at this microfinance no model as a way of ensuring that the public is invested in what the outcome yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you, did you not talk about your experience in New York City yes. whereby young artists were given money? Yeah. Not so much, but I didn't get the impression that there was sort of a quid pro quo on a return on investment. No, definitely. There, there's basically a, um, a measure against sales. So if it's records or, paint or visual art, uh, ceramics, sculpture, whatever, there's a kind of uh, basically betting against what the market will bear. So if you have to be realistic as an artist in order to present a model in which, uh, you know, if I went to you and said, I'd like a million dollars for this painting, you might say, well, you've got no standing in that field. I don't see how the re investment's going to come. But if I was shown a track record of every year my record sales have gone up, and this is what I'd like to project, and could you not invest rather than give me the money? Because I think that that model leads to that kind of pandering, which I think doesn't put the artist in a good light. Okay, any other questions? Okay, good. Thank you very much Thank for you. your deputation. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, the next uh, deputy is Scott Miller Berry of Workman Arts. I gather that's you. <laughs> that is me. Sorry for the problem. That's all right. So you have five minutes and then uh, questions uh, after, perhaps. Sure. Councillor Campbell, Councillors DiCiano, Pasternak, and Holiday. thanks for your time. My name is Scott Miller-Berry. I'm a homeowner near St. Clair and Jane in Ward 13, and by day I'm Managing Director at Workman Arts. Workman Arts is a charitable arts organization that provides support and services to artists in all creative disciplines living with mental illness and or addictions issues. I'm also a filmmaker, and like Menon, I'm a proud member of the inaugural Cultural Leaders Lab, a partnership with the Toronto Arts Council and Banff. I'm here today to thank you for your ongoing support of the arts and culture in Toronto, to speak about the impact of our city's support for arts and culture, and to encourage the committee and council to fulfill the previously approved budget, uh, pardon me, funding commitments, and confirm the proposed $5 million increase for fiscal year 2016 which was referenced in the previous question. Uh, obviously, uh, making the case to dedicate uh, tight resources to arts funding can be a challenge, but it's a challenge that Toronto's residents, businesses, neighborhoods, and visitors are counting on you to meet. According to 2015 Art Stats by Leger Marketing, over 97% of Torontonians see at least one benefit of the arts to the city of Toronto. Having worked for 20 plus years for community-based, nonprofit, and or non-funded arts collectives and organizations, I can honestly share that interactions with art and artists allow us the opportunity to connect with each other, to interpret new ideas, and to build resilient communities. Arts programming helps us engage our youth and welcome newcomers to our neighborhoods. Artists bring innovation and inspiration to city building. And while art may often uh, arise from the minds of individual artists, it's based on an entire ecosystem of art support. Workman Arts has over 300 members and produces the annual film festival Rendezvous with Madness, uh, which this past November welcomed almost 10,000 uh, attendees to our nine-day event at four venues across downtown Toronto. Our support from the TAC has been invaluable to present our festival uh, and support our 300 member artists who are all living with mental health and or addictions issues. Our organization, as a result of vital TAC support, is making a difference in the lives of, uh, of literally hundreds and thousands of Torontonians and assisting in their recoveries. According to national research, uh, despite often higher than average levels of formal education, Canadian artists earn much lower than the average income. In Canada, the average artist earns $15,000 less than the average Canadian worker. The average dancer, for one example, has an income of less than $18,000, which puts them well below the low income cutoff. In this context, the economic impact, uh, this, puts, this puts the context of economic impact uh, that is brought by the cultural sector, because as you know, arts and culture contributes 
billions of dollars each year to Toronto's GDP. In closing, it's in all of our interest to keep artists here, living here, working here, contributing to the life and vibrancy of our city. So I'm here to thank you again for your support and hopefully uh, implore you to not cut back on previous commitments to get to the per capita levels um, as uh, hoped and uh, continue to expand the city's support for the arts sector. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Milliberry. Um, you intrigued me because um, you have a, a special uh, group that works with you and that is those with mental illness and disabilities that you'd mentioned. Um, have you found a methodology or, or is there an ability to calculate the value of the work that you do with them? It's a particular group and uh, in, in, in is, the, is there a way that you can leverage that value to compare against funding that you do get if you do receive any and, and what that returns back to the community? We, uh, it's a thank you for the question. Uh, we are in the middle of doing our first ever strategic return on investment, so I don't have any numbers this moment to kind of quote back to you, but we are, we are really seriously, because we've been around almost 30 years, uh, we are really trying to, to get that data to, to actually monetize and see the impact of the support that we are providing. How did how, can you share a little bit about maybe how some of the concepts work? And I don't I don't mean to put you on the spot for the mm -hmm. value because that that obviously takes time. But how do you go about and figure that out? Um, well, in one okay, so I'll try to give you one sure. kind of concrete example. Um, we uh, with 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 our funding support, we've invested in a new uh, database program that we're now able to track our members uh, art rentals or sales or um, any um, any arts activity that has brought them income. Okay. Right. So we are able to to look at the value of because all because all of our members uh, receives receive free training free membership like there's no cost to our members to be a member of our organization right. so we're just looking at the literally the value of our support in terms of their income that they've received as a result of our organization helping them make those sales and rentals does that great yeah. uh, that thank you that sure. helps yeah. right. just uh, curious uh, mm -hmm. how many how many uh, artists do you support a year? Do you support them for months of times or years at a time or? We, um, to be honest, we had, we had 13, 13 in inquiries last week for people wanting to become new members. We have a waiting list right now of 150. We actually don't have the, the, the staff and the resources, like honestly, to just take on. You know, it's, we, don't, we don't have an unlimited membership, obviously, because we only have a certain number of workshops and training programs and space. Um, uh, sorry, you asked. Um. <laughs> but the, num the number, the number in for what duration? During sure, uh, it's a it's it's a great question. So we are doing we're doing intake all year round, right? Someone wants to be a member, all they have to do is disclose that they have received services at one point in their life for mental health and or an addiction issue. We don't ask for proof. We don't ask for any sort of yeah, um, doctors, you know, etc. Et um, and then from there, it's sort of an once someone becomes a member, it's kind of a it's kind of an evaluation that our membership manager kind of m does through her experience, where it's not um, we don't cut people off, so to speak. So if someone is w it, it wants to have, be an active member, take a workshop, be involved, and they're you know relatively stable, so to speak, then that's great. So we don't actually we don't actually have a term limit for members, but of course that makes it challenging to incorporate new members into the organization. And our membership is getting younger. We're seeing more and more people in the 19 to 25 year range coming to us looking for access. And, and do do you have professional? Are you professionally trained in mental health issues? Our director is a registered nurse, and some of us on staff have certain training. But but there is we don't we don't we, we don't provide direct services for for mental health and or addictions on site. But we but we do have we, we do take trainings, and we you know we do deal with issues obviously as they come up. But we're not a direct service organization. So you get City of Toronto funding now. We do j only for the film festival, technically, oh, okay. o not for the training and education programs. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much for coming. Sure. Out, uh, Thank you. Thanks for your time. Next, we have Brad Dixon. Good evening, Brad. Oh, how are you? Yes. All right. So, 
We have five minutes. Okay. Well, thank you, councillors, for hearing me. Um, first off, uh, Toronto has an allocation issue, not a sure. Toronto has an allocation issue, not necessarily a revenue issue. And I'm just going to touch base with regards to some allocations that deal with operation of the City of Toronto. Uh, specifically, for example, with regards to the uh, waste and fraud uh, hotline, I'm suggesting you actually, instead of having the voicemail there, you actually uh, uh, have a person operating that and perhaps a staff backing it up. The reason being is that currently right now when a waste and uh, fraud call goes in, it actually is looked at by the manager of that specific department who has a vested interest of not allowing uh, more information to go out and make the department look bad, whereas essentially if you actually looked into waste and fraud um, by a separate entity, it would probably be a better solution. Um, I'm also, as Councillor Campbell is aware, I'm suggesting you eliminate the pay for performance for managers. Um, as I say, with their current situation, you know, they've got uh, bonuses or, or sorry, they've got benefits, et cetera. Uh, you can still have performance review happening, but again, allocation wise, I'm suggesting that to eliminate that. Um, I with regards to supervisors on an on call basis, um, I suggested this in a couple of budgets ago. Right now, uh, many supervisors are on the same hours, 8.30 to whatever, and, and uh, after 4.30 they can be on call. Yet, they can turn around and eliminate that by putting people on shifts. Um, basically, if you need somebody on the weekends, et cetera, there's no reason why all supervisors have to be working Monday through Friday. Um, now, the other thing too is that I've seen departments expand. For example, you've got what used to be parks and rec and forestry as one entity with one director, et cetera, that's now expanded into three separate entities. So as I was saying, going back and reducing the size of some of those entities would probably be worthwhile. Um, now, I, I found it interesting <coughs> during the wood, Woodbine racetrack um, promotion uh, or, or um, expansion that Economic um, uh, Toronto looked at uh, part-time uh, hours of, of people and said, well, if, if they equal a full-time uh, staff hours, then that equals a full-time job. So you could have two part-time people, essentially, and they said, well, that equals a full-time job. Uh, and yet, when pointed out to Economic Toronto, I said, if that was the case, then in your department, if you did that, you would have all your people working three days a week, two days a week, and essentially, you could take that same salary and get two people out of it. Um, I sort of sit back and said, if that's the case, if, if Economic Toronto believes in that, why not turn around and put that into Economic Toronto, where you sit back and said, hey, you know, you have two directors. W you s have the same single wage, but now what happens is you benefit where you sit back and said there's no pension that has to be paid, there's no benefits, et cetera. I know it's a little bit radical, but as I say, with regards to um, uh, how Economic Toronto looked at it, I'm just, well, let's turn it back onto them and sort of see from there. Now, <coughs> a little bit more radical uh, concept is I'm suggesting eliminating the Toronto community housing, selling off the property, and going to a rent subsidies program. The reason being is, is that you're saying that Toronto is the largest landlord. Well, right now, if that largest landlord were to do the things that it's doing right now as a private company, bylaws would be totally all over them. So. I think the funds could be better allocated, and rather than pigeonholing people into Toronto community housing, if all of a sudden you, s you say, here's a rent subsidy for this person, right now they've got to wait until a Toronto community housing uh, apartment comes up, whereas if all of a sudden they've got rent subsidy, they can go anywhere that they want. And the other thing too is there's a number of repairs, et cetera, that, that, are, that are coming up. A again, that's going to be a burden on, on the city of Toronto, whereas if else if essentially if you end up selling off those properties and utilize the funds for there and, and turn around and use that for rent subsidies, again, uh, a rent subsidy is probably a better program. It doesn't, it doesn't bind the person into only Toronto community housing. And people buying the, um, buying the property can then turn around and utilize that for mixed use however they, however they want. Right, but as I say, it, it, it's just dumbfounding that we're looking at billions of dollars to basically upkeep this property, and yet what we're not doing is turning around and allowing the people who qualify for that to select where they want to live. Right. The um, okay. All right. Well, that's pretty well it. Um, you brought up a, a relevant point. Uh, I did attend a budget committee meeting yesterday with the auditor present, 
And uh, as a member of the audit committee, I kind of get excited about those things. And I think you brought up, <laughs> my colleagues are laughing, but it's serious stuff. Um, you did bring up the fraud and waste hotline, and it's maybe more of a comment than a question. Um, you are on the right track. I think there are changes that are coming to it. It's seen as a very important um, um, leg of the audit process. It's not all of it. There's a lot more to audit, but, but that is one of them is reacting to tips, essentially, of things to look at. Um, and there's a lot of talk right now about unifying public complaints, um, whether it be about uh, internal or, or, or elected officials or fraud and waste, because we don't want to expect citizens to navigate through the complaints process. There should be a very easy window. So it's my hope that um, we'll all see changes over time of that. Um, but you brought up an excellent point, and I don't hear that from citizens very often. It's, it was enshrined in some reports, and I can tell you that I will pass your comment on directly to the auditor when I have, a, when I have an opportunity. So thank you for it. Okay. Well, j if you're familiar with the background of the origin of the Fraud and Waste Hotline. I am. Okay. It was an individual employee who right. brought up to managers that another employee was stealing half a million dollars out of... Uh, cash that was being given for arena funds. She went to the managers and basically nothing was done. They had, I think the employee had to end up going to the audit, the audit to get anything done. And that's why it came about. So as I say, countless times where essentially their own departments and all that stuff don't follow up on it. Understood. A and thank you for the comment. Okay. So I have a question about Toronto Community Housing. Sorry, we had our presentation yesterday from them, which was, uh, I, I thought, very impressive. My, my thinking uh, uh, was not unlike yours and that this is a significant burden on the city. However, um, do you really think that anyone, they have $9 billion in assets. Do you really think that there would, given the state and condition of those assets, do you really think that there would be a purchaser for those assets? Well, uh, yes, because essentially if all of a sudden you allow those purchasers to turn and use mixed use. But then so, it, so, so, but what I'm saying is I, I don't want to pigeonhole the people I want to empower the people who are qualified there, but if all of a sudden they got to rent subsidies, they walk in with a guarantee, um, uh, you know, cash in hand, so to speak, that that, that, that landlord knows they're going to continually get from the government. So as I say, if all of a sudden, you know, a, a condominium owner says, hey, I want to rent my place out to somebody who qualifies for a rent subsidy. And as I say, the, the, they're not pigeonholed anyway. So, you know, again, if all of a sudden you free up um, that property to be used in mixed use, then, then I, I suspect, you know, right now, I can't say 100%, but neither can you because that hasn't even ventured with any of the property. No, but are, are you aware that a lot of the, or a, 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 um, a fairly important component of the residents that live in Toronto community housing are people with mental health issues yep. and who have challenges, you know, just going about their daily uh, operation of, of, of life. And the Toronto Community Housing provides a support in that regard. That if it were, and do you not feel that if this were a private entity, that that's, those supports might not be there? Well, wi within right now, as far as having the building itself, those supports can still be there, even though it's a private, even though it's a private entity. Right now, as the same with regards to the building itself, the maintenance of the building, et cetera, is taking away from those services that could be offered. Because essentially now the city of Toronto has to start paying for maintenance. It, so, so if all of a sudden I got to put, you know, if I got I to repair a leaky uh, whatever, that's not a benefit to those people who have the mental issues because essentially you're now taking money away that could be part of the services there. I'm just sort of saying reallocate those, those funds and so that rather than being the landlord, you end up basically utilizing your funds, and again, when I talk about allocation, you utilize your funds for the services that you that you want, right? And uh, that, that that's basically it. Good. Well, thank you for coming okay. and uh, offering your thoughts. All right, thanks. Thank you. Next, we have Sir Osabal. Oz Osabal. Nope. Okay. Last, we have Karen Ewing of Holy Child Catholic School. Hi, Karen. Good evening. And budget committee. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the school nutrition program. I'm the mother of two boys, aged five and 11. I quit a full-time position in purchasing to be available to support my boys, one of which completed a program at a section 23 school prior to enrolling at Holy Child Catholic School in Ward 2. The school principal asked me if I'd be interested in being the school nutrition program coordinator 
and although I could not fathom how I was supposed to get snacks to 360 children at one time, I took on the role. Thanks to the help of two parent volunteers, we accomplished the task, especially given financial challenges in feeding that many children. The objective of the program is to provide a healthy snack for children covering three food groups based on the Canada Food Guide, consisting of a dairy product, a fruit or vegetable, and a grain product. After I started the program, I found out that the budget we have for the children's snack is insufficient to meet the goal for this full school year. The last couple years, the program's tapped out around May. We are extremely grateful for the grants we receive from the municipal and provincial governments, but they represent only a portion of the funds needed to cover the full cost of the program. For example, through co government grants and family contribution, our school is allocated approximately 46 cents per day per child. Milk alone costs 52 cents each, and we average approximately 72 cents per child per day, alternating between two and three of the food groups to stretch our budget. We cannot even afford to serve pears and clementine oranges are a treat. The importance of the program has become so apparent to me. I'm amazed at how excited the children get when we show up with snacks and they can see what they're going to get that day. A couple of teachers let me know of children in their class that come to school with no lunch and asked if needed would there be leftover food available to help feed these children. I had no prior conception of children lacking food in our society before starting this role as school nutrition coordinator. It was heartbreaking for me to learn parents have actually kept their children home from school, so it was not apparent they had no food to send with their child, and they were afraid of the school contacting the children's aid. Teachers actually pool their lunches together to feed children that come to school with no food. Evidently, people keep quiet about their circumstances, and their children are suffering. These are the children we have become aware of that don't have food. There are others that simply don't have access to nutritious food. The first time we served kiwi, some classes did not even know what it was. You should see how happy the children are when they get their oranges. The school nutrition program is vital in providing an opportunity for every child to have access to nutritious food. The children can eat and fellowship together. Everyone's offered the same things. Every single child's offered nutritious food. Religious or allergic food constraints are tailored to meet the need of the child as required. As we know, nutrition is vital to children's well-being, growth, and learning. We desperately need your help to support the school nutrition program for the sake of our children. It's one major avenue we can support the lives of all the children in our communities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, questions? No? Councilor Fassman? No. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. You mentioned that uh, you have a shortfall uh, when it comes to uh, the needs in the school. Are you, uh, do you have layered support, uh, some from Toronto, City of Toronto, some from maybe food share, some from a parent contribution? How, how are you funded? Um, we get grants from the Angel Foundation and parent contributions. But in our school, the average family income is about 44000 and uh, most of them are single parents, and we don't get a lot. And this represents an, an afternoon uh, snack? A morning snack. A morning snack. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Is there any el anyone else who would like to offer commentary, make a deputation? No? All right, so that concludes our evening's uh, list of speakers. Councillor Pasternak, if you would, please. That the Budget Subcommittee for Etobicoke, York, and North York Civic Center co consultation receive for information the public presentations and the communications submitted by members of the public. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all very much for coming out. We appreciate it. And uh, if you have any, any questions or further comments, you can, of course, direct them to your counselor. And uh, other uh, public deputations will be held uh, in, um, at the, uh, tomorrow night, we are at the North York Civic Center. And then on the 14th, on Wednesday, we are at the York Civic Center. Thank you all again for your participation. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. We need to do. Yeah. We need to put a motion to the budget that says anybody who wants a 5% tax increase